someone has said, Jesus Christ is the star of astronomy. He is the rock of geology. He is the lion and lamb of zoology. He is the healer of all diseases and the harmonizer of all discords. Great men in history have come and gone, but he lives on. Satan couldn't seduce him. Herod could not kill him. Death could not destroy him. And the grave could not hold him. Praise God for Jesus Christ. What a magnificent description of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet such a description pales in comparison to the description we're going to read this morning from Colossians chapter 1. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 1 as we look at Jesus Christ, originator, creator, reconciler of all things. Colossians chapter 1. Now remember, uh, the Colossian Christians were being tempted to embrace other doctrines, other belief systems, not to discard Christianity, but to add to Christianity. They were being told that Jesus Christ is important, but you need something else or someone else. You need Jesus and this philosophy. You need Jesus and this thought system. You need Jesus and this experience. There's nothing new under the sun, as Solomon said. And the Apostle Paul writes this letter to the Colossians as well as to all of us to say, no, Jesus Christ is sufficient. He has sufficiently saved you. He has sufficiently secured you. He has sufficiently empowered you to leave, live a victorious life. You need nothing or no one other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you say, how do I know that, Pastor? How do I know that Jesus is sufficient for my salvation? Or maybe you're a Christian this morning. You say, I'm already a believer, but I'm going through a tremendous trial right now in my life. How do I know that Jesus Christ is sufficient to carry me through that trial? Well, Paul answers that question this morning by showing how Jesus Christ is central to three important realms of this universe. And when you understand the importance, the centrality of Jesus Christ in these areas, you'll understand why it is Jesus is sufficient for whatever need you're facing this morning. Look, first of all, at what Paul says in verse 15. He says, Jesus Christ is central in creation. If you ever doubt the sufficiency of Christ to take care of your needs, remember his role in creation. Now, you know a lot of Christians are mistaken about this. They think the first time Jesus Christ ever began to exist was at Bethlehem. They think that was the beginning of Jesus Christ. No, he is eternally coexistent, co-eternal with God the Father. And that's what Paul is going to remind us here. He is going to remind us of the role that Jesus played in the creation, not only of the world, but of the universe. Notice the four truths about Christ and his relationship to creation. Paul says, first of all, Christ was pre-existent to the creation. He existed before the creation. Look at verse 15. Jesus is the image of the invisible God And he is the firstborn of all creation. I want you to underline that word image. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. Do you realize no man has ever seen God? Because God is a spirit. You can't see a spirit. But in John 14, 9, Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. If you want to know what God the Spirit is like, all you have to do is look at Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the manifestation of God the Father. Not only that, but notice he is the firstborn of all creation. Underline that word firstborn. Prototakis in Greek, the firstborn of all creation. Now this word is going to be used twice today. It's very important to understand what it means. Prototakis. Now some people like Jehovah's Witnesses, have you ever had one of those knock on your front door? you know, and want to try to convert you. Uh, They love this verse because they say, look here. It says Jesus Christ wasn't always existent. He was born. He came into existence at Bethlehem. He is the firstborn of all creation. But that word prototakis, firstborn, doesn't mean first chronologically. It means first 
in importance. That's what the word means. Let me prove that to you. In Psalm 89, verse 27, God is talking about his coming son, the Messiah. And he says, he is my firstborn. And then he goes on to say, the highest king in all of the earth. Messiah will be my firstborn, the highest king in all the earth. It doesn't refer to his place chronologically, but his place in rank. Jesus is the firstborn. He is the highest of all creation. How do we know Jesus is sufficient? First of all, Christ was preexistent to the creation. Notice secondly in verse 16, Christ was the cause of the creation. Look at verse 16. For by him, talking about Jesus, for by him all things were created in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Now, whenever we think about creation, Genesis 1, we tend to think of which member of the Godhead doing the creating. We think of God the Father doing all the heavy lifting, don't we? He's the one we think of who created this world and this universe. That's not what Paul says. It wasn't God the Father. It was Jesus the Son who was the agent of creation. Jesus Christ is the one who created this vast universe. And notice he says here, not only does he create everything that's visible, he created everything that is invisible, thrones, dominions, uh, rulers, and authorities. That is a reference to the spirit realm, angels and demons. Some in Colossae were trying to worship angels. And Paul said, that's ridiculous. Why would you worship angels when Jesus is the one who created all of the angels? Jesus Christ was the cause of creation. No wonder uh, disease fled from him. No wonder the winds and the waves obeyed Jesus. He is the one who created it all. That's how we know Jesus Christ is sufficient. Not only that, thirdly, Christ is the heir of creation. Look at verse 16 again. All these things have been created through him and for him. Now, these prepositions, through and for, may not seem like much to you, but they meant a lot to Paul's audience. You see, the Greeks taught that everything that exists has to have a primary cause, that is a plan, an instrumental cause, that is the power to execute the plan, and a final cause, the purpose of the plan. Paul said Jesus Christ is all three when it comes to this universe. He is the primary cause. He planned it all. He is the uh, 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 agent. He's the one who caused it to happen. He's the instrumental cause. And he is the ultimate cause. Everything that he created, he created for himself. And if that seems extremely selfish to you, he created everything for himself and all of those of us who are related to him by faith. You see, the moment you trust in Christ as your Savior, you become a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Everything in this universe that exists for Him suddenly becomes yours as well. He is the one who is the heir of all creation. And then number four, Jesus is the one who sustains the creation. Look at verse 17. Jesus is before all things, and in Him all things are held together. Now, you know from your American history that the majority of our founding fathers were evangelical Christians. You won't hear that from the secular realm, but the fact is they were mostly evangelical Christians. However, there were a few who weren't. And among those were Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. They were deists. Now, deists believed in God, sort of. But their belief about God was that God did not intervene in the affairs of men on earth. That God created this world, he kind of wound it up like a clock, and then he left it to run on its own. So God created the world, then he walked away, and the world is on its own. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches not only did God create this world, but he is the one who holds it and upholds it that keeps it from spinning into chaos. In Hebrews 1.3, the passage we read just a moment ago, remember what the writer said? He said, he, talking about Jesus, upholds all things by the word of his power. We're going to see how Jesus is sufficient for every need you have. Look at this next part. It says that Jesus Christ is central in the church. Look at verse 18. 
Jesus is also the head of the body, the church. Now, the term church, ecclesia, most of the time in the New Testament refers to the local church. Ninety of the 110 times ecclesia is used in the Bible, it refers to a local body of believers like First Baptist Church Dallas. But occasionally, the word refers to all Christians everywhere. The universal church, the church on earth, the church in heaven, we're all part of the family of God if we're born again. And that's how he's using the word here. Jesus is the head of the body. That's one of the most common images in the Bible of our relationship to Christ, the body. He is the head. We are the parts of the body. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, For you are Christ's body, and you are individually a part of it. Now, that word head sometimes means authority. And that's certainly true. Christ is the authority of the church. But it also can mean source or origin, the center of power. And that's how Paul is using it here. He's saying that Jesus Christ is the head, that is, he is the source of all of the energy in the body. Just as our human head gives direction to the rest of our body, but also provides the energy for our body, so it is with Jesus Christ. The energy that flows from the head, Jesus, flows into our life as well if we are connected to him by faith. All of the power that belongs to Jesus is available to you right now. And one of the greatest manifestations of the power available to you is seen in the next phrase. He is the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. There's that word again, firstborn, prototakis. He is the firstborn of the dead. Now, what does that mean, he is the firstborn of the dead? Does that mean Jesus was the first person who was ever raised from the dead? No. Did you know Jesus was not the first person raised from the dead? In the Old Testament, some people were raised from the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Jesus was not the first person chronologically to be raised from the dead. But here's the difference. Everyone in the Old Testament, Lazarus in the New Testament, when they were raised from the dead... They were raised in their old, dilapidated, sin-infected bodies. And guess what? They got sick again, and they died again. But Jesus Christ was the first person to be raised in a new resurrection body. A body that was free from sin, a body that would never grow sick again, a body that would never die again. In that sense, he was the firstborn, he was of the first of a new order of resurrection bodies. That word prototakis, firstborn, is the word that we get our English word prototype from. Uh, I was watching this week a documentary about um, the new Boeing 787 Dreamliner, the most advanced jetliner that has ever been built. Uh, Boeing delivered the first uh, 787 to its uh, Japanese customer this last week. It cost $150 million, this jetliner. Boeing spent $33 billion developing this jetliner. They're going to sell, they say, 3,000 jetliners in the next 10 years. But you know what? Before they cranked up the assembly line, before they started producing all of these jetliners, about 10 a month, the first thing they had to do was to build a prototype, the first airplane. And once they got that first airplane built and all the kinks taken out of it, once they had that perfected, then every other plane on the assembly line was a replica. It matched that first prototype. Now listen, that's the word Paul uses here to refer to Jesus Christ and his body. Jesus is the first resurrection body on the assembly line. And every one of us who is connected to Jesus Christ by faith, guess what? We're going to receive one of those bodies as well. His was the first, but it certainly wasn't the last. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, As in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. I have people ask me all the time about what our bodies in heaven and on earth are going to be like after the resurrection. You know, will we know one another? Uh, will we keep some of our distinctive features or will we all look alike? And, uh, of course, the most pressing theological question, will we be able to eat in our new bodies? You know, people are really hung up on that one. Well, when people ask, what are our bodies going to be like? All I say is, look at Jesus. 
Look at his resurrection body. His was the prototype for the body you're going to receive. In 1 John 3, 2, John says, Brethren, it has not appeared yet what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Think about Jesus' body. In many ways, it resembled his earthly body. He had distinct characteristics that made him recognizable immediately to his disciples. He even retained the nail prints in his hands. But it also had a supernatural aspect to it. I mean, is this cool or not? I mean, he could go through doors and walls and travel from place to place. And yes, he was able to eat as well. It was a natural body in one sense that it was recognizable, but it was a supernatural body. And the Bible says, if you're a believer in Christ, that's the kind of body you're going to receive as well. He is the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Now, here's the point. If Jesus Christ, if Jesus Christ is sufficient to deliver you from the power of death, don't you think he is powerful enough? to deliver you through whatever problem you're facing today. I mean, if he can take your body out of the grave one day and change it, transform it to that new body that will never die, if he is able to do that, can't he see you through that storm you're encountering right now? That's the point of all of this. Jesus Christ is sufficient he is sufficient for your salvation. He is sufficient to carry you through the storm you're encountering right now. And that is seen in the central role he has in the church. Number three, Jesus Christ is central in salvation. Look at verse 19. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. Remember, the Gnostics said, oh, Jesus Christ couldn't be the Son of God if he were human because God can't inhabit humanity. Well, the flesh is evil, and that would make Jesus sinful. Therefore, Jesus was just a spirit. No, Paul said, it was the Father's good pleasure for all of the fullness of God to dwell in Jesus. God poured all of himself in Jesus. And now look at verse 20. And through him, Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. I want you to underline this word, reconcile. He has reconciled all things to himself. That word reconcile means to change a relationship from hostility to harmony. When Paul uses this term, reconciled, that he has reconciled us to God, he uses this term, reconcile, in a different way. And here is how he's using it. When he talks about reconciliation, he's not talking about two people who agree to part company and then agree to come back together. Instead, the word picture here is of one person who makes a unilateral decision to leave a relationship. And the other person, the injured party, decides to try to reconcile that relationship. That is exactly a picture of what God has done for us. See, the decision for our relationship to God to be broken was not a mutual decision. It was a unilateral decision we have made. The Bible says, but God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He is the one who has initiated the reconciliation. In 1 Peter 3, 18, Paul, uh, Peter writes, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. God is the one who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. May I add this important word? There are some people who misinterpret this verse to say, well, everyone is automatically reconciled to God by Christ's death on the cross. After all, isn't that what the text says? That he has reconciled all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross? Everybody is automatically reconciled to God. Everyone is going to be saved. No, that's not what the passage is teaching. Go back to that husband and wife. That husband can make the first step and trying to bring about a reconciliation. But the wife has to ultimately agree that she wants to be reconciled to her husband. It has to be a mutual decision. And so it is in our relationship with 
God. Yes, God has taken the first step. He has paid the penalty for our sin by sending Christ to die for us. But God doesn't drag anyone back to himself kicking and screaming. The Bible says we have to agree that we want to be reconciled to God. We must individually trust in Christ as our Savior. The point of this passage is Jesus Christ is sufficient for every need that you have. And perhaps the greatest demonstration of his sufficiency is that Jesus did for you and me what we could not do for ourselves. He has made peace with God. He has been the atonement, the payment for our sins. Jesus Christ is sufficient. Jesus Christ is the central issue in this universe he has created. And what you do with him is the central issue in your life and in your eternity. Sao cơn mưa đêm em đã làm gì giờ? Khó thuốc lăn lần đi giờ. Anh chỉ muốn một đêm này không ngày ai u mơ nên gì? Yeah yeah, em muốn là về mà xa mờ. Em đã cần đi nhưng mà ba mùi. Anh không thể giữ em được bên mình. Và bao nhiêu người xấu là người ghen tị. Và nhiều người mấy em đã quên rồi. Và là con má nằm bên tôi. Giờ chỉ con má nằm bên tôi. Yeah, anh chẳng thể giữ được cho em.